It's uh, Friday, March 12, 2010, and uh, this is an interview with Henry Pallada. We're here at the Library of Congress, Madison Building, the Veterans History Project Information Center. My name is Tom Wiener. I'm a research specialist with the Veterans History Project, and with me is my colleague, Jamie Stevenson, who is a liaison specialist with the Veterans History Project, and also with us, who will be asking her father some questions, is Maria Pallada, who is serving the United States Marine Corps and is getting promoted today to Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, welcome to the Library of Congress, Mr. Pallada. Thank you. Okay. Welcome to the library. Thank you for inviting me. Sure. It's a real honor. Great. Good to have you here. Just to, let's just start with the beginning of your life. Where were you born? I was born in Cleveland, Ohio, uh -huh. December 23rd, 22nd, 1931, uh -huh. and uh, I wasn't returned as a gift. <laughs> <laughs> now, how many brothers and sisters did you have? I have uh, four brothers and two sisters. Uh -huh. And your parents? My parents were, uh, both came from Italy. Mm -hmm. My dad, uh, I can't remember the exact years, but he came here when he was 10, and he's, well, 10, and he served in the First World War uh, from the one year that they were in, from 17, 1917 to 1918. So he came here when he was 10 years old, which was what year? Well, you think from 1918, he was 17 when he went in, okay. I believe, All right. approximately, and, uh, and he served the one year yeah. in the military. Okay. Then he lived in New York, mm -hmm. and he was a tradesman there, and uh, did a variety of things. Uh, of course, he was of Italian descent at that time. It wasn't an easy thing for certain yeah. ethnics in the city of New York. Mm -hmm. And uh, but he uh, he uh, did a lot of a lot of jobs, from being a barber to sharpening anything with an edge. He worked his way, and then he, he moved to Columbus, Ohio, and that's where he met my mother, who had come here in 1920 with her parents uh, from Italy, and uh, they settled there, and then my dad moved to Columbus, met my mother, and that's where, where they, they went. They had three, four children there, and then he moved to Cleveland, and he had three more. And what was he doing in Cleveland? He was a locksmith, and he had private business. He ran for a long time. So then he, uh, he was a locksmith. That was his trade. Now you had old. Did you have older brothers? I have an older brother. I uh, would like to say this: I have four brothers and myself. Of course, we all served in the military. My oldest brother Joe served uh, in Europe, uh, Second World War, and my brother Jack, second. He served in the Philippines, and then my brother, we call Jiggs, name's Julio, but he uh, he served in the States. He had eye problems, but he served here. And then my youngest brother, uh, George, was born in 1939. He was the baby. He served at the night sites in, in that era, where night sites were all over the country. So he served in that capacity. What's a night site? Well, that was uh, where they had the anti missile missile installations throughout the country. He served, I can't remember just what states, he didn't serve in Ohio, but he did serve in, I can't be sure if it was Minnesota, but different, they had sites all over. And of course they're since gone, but at that time it was a prime and a defense system that he worked in. So um, what were you doing uh, in Cleveland when you were called to service? And you were drafted or did you enlist? No, I was drafted. I had notions that joined the Navy for three years when I graduated from high school and pretty much determined to do that. You graduated what year? 1951. Okay. Uh, anyway, we, uh, <laughs> when they bumped it to four years, I says, no, I'm going to trust my luck to the Army. And of course, 1950, Korean War broke out, so we had all had notions, all the fellows my age, that we were going to be in the service one way or the other. Yeah. So some volunteered to be drafted, mm -hmm. worked through the reserves. I just, I was drafted. And, and were, you, were you working at the time? I was working in an industrial supply house as a clerk. 
and uh, my number came up and uh, gladly went. Uh, my one brother asked me, he says, you know, three of us have been in, we probably can get you out, you know, get mm -hmm. plead to the draft board and all that. But I said, no, no, I got to go. And, uh, uh, How did your parents feel? Well, uh, my mother had been through it so much, and uh, my dad had been, so they knew it was inevitable. They didn't really just went with the flow. Yeah. I weren't they? I'm sure my mother wasn't that happy about another son going into their service. It worked out. So. Okay. Where did you go for basic? I went to, well, that's an interesting story. We we went to, uh, you remember that day, the 24th of July, and they marched us in Cleveland to a sportsman's bar, and there was a big sign about that size with Ronald Reagan selling uh, Chesterfield cigarettes. <laughs> but anyway, I always remember that scene. They, they, marched us to the railroad depot. And we got on board and wound up in Fort Meade, Maryland. We didn't know where we were going, they didn't tell us. Woke up in the morning and the first sight was the Washington Monument. So we knew we were in the Washington area. Well, we wound up at Fort Meade, Maryland. And we spent, I don't know, a week there at least, where they shaved our, our haircuts lasted about 32 seconds. And we went through the channel and got us up 3.30 in the morning and broke us in real good and fast. I think we got our first shots. I can't remember that exactly, military shots. But, and then we had breakfast. And uh, that was an, another memorable experience because we went to this big uh, uh, place to eat and a super cafeteria. And they gave us one of the most famous military meal breakfasts, SOS. Which stands for? <laughs> Go ahead. You want me to say it? Oh, yeah, sure. Shit on a shingle. And which, which translated into civilian terms is? I don't know what the civilian term <laughs> I still call it that. Yeah, but I mean, it's literally, what is it? Uh, I really don't know. You don't know? Can't cream think. chip beef on toast. Well, that's right. Yeah. Cream chip beef on toast. Yeah. It's just that's too long to say. <laughs> no, SOS is much easier. Well, well, it wasn't so bad. It was I wasn't used to it, uh, but uh, the uh, the bacon or whatever they use was like shoelace. <laughs> it couldn't recognize whether it was meat or what it was, but the cream was good. But anyway, that was our first breakfast in the military. Yeah. It was, it was memorable. Had and you been away from home before that? Let me think about it. Not really. No, I hadn't been. That was my really my first going away from home. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you were, were when you were working, were you living at home? Or yes, you I moved was. Out on yeah, your no, I lived, no, I was living at home. Okay. Right. No, I was living at home. And, uh, <clears throat> and yeah, that was my first uh, sojourn away from home, yeah. Yeah. meeting all kinds of people for from all over yeah. the country, and there were doubts whether they were from this country because they talked different. I mean, you had to get, it was real education because the people from uh, Minnesota up in that area had a little accent of Swedish or Norwegian, and uh, ones from the South, there was just a variety, and of course they looked at us and probably said the same thing, you know. And from Massachusetts, they couldn't say half, they had to say half, but you had to learn all that. But it was your attitude, I think. But uh, there were some problems because there was the first time, um, and I was part of that when Truman integrated the military and the draft. We were amongst that. That doesn't mean that we didn't get along, black and white. But it's something that should be said. That we're we weren't prepared, and blacks weren't. We weren't. I would say the southern blacks were more amenable. Than the northern, the ones from New Jersey, and that they chip on the shoulders to some right? extent. But as it was a conflict at first, but as time went on, there was people got blended better. Yeah. Uh, not to say that it got 100% mesh, but it did get a lot better. We had good friends on both sides, and yeah. uh, wasn't a problem uh, to speak of. In a war zone like Korea, front line, uh, you have the same foe. 
doesn't matter what your background is or where you're from, you're all there for the same purpose. How long were you in basic then? Well, that was an uh, interesting thing too because, you know, we went unknown to anything, but they sent us to Fort Knox. I, I think we took some tests and uh, on your knowledge of everything, and I happen to know what a spanner wrench was. Not a lot of people know what a spanner wrench, but it's like a question mark wrench, and it's used on vehicles, especially tanks. So I wound up going to Fort Knox, 3rd third, third Armored Division, and uh, four weeks, the first eight weeks, was basic training, infantry, rifle, all that. Then the next eight were tank training, and then from there, I'll leave and uh, overseas. Really? Now half the company, I forget how many was, 200 in the company, half of them went to Germany and the other half went to Far East. And uh, I had one little gripe there was that they only gave us going to Korea six days off before going overseas, wow. before Christmas. Because we started in July 24th and we ended the end of November. So we had the first few days of December, and then we had to be in Chicago on December 6th. December 6th. And then we caught on a train and went to Seattle. Of course, we didn't know where we were going. But uh, you didn't know that the European you, you guys. Knew, you knew you were going to the Far East. You just weren't. Yeah, we didn't know how we were, how yeah. we were going or what, okay. where we were going to be yeah. at that. Well, it was it was good. It was a troop train, yeah. but. Uh, the European guys got like 13 or 14 days, and of course that. Wait a minute, they're they're going to a, a non-combatant area, and we're going to a combatant area, and we're getting less time at home. It didn't seem fair, but the yeah. the way they ran things at that time in Korea was a pipeline replacement system. Mm -hmm. So this was just the army, uh, Marines, and all the others were units, and they came back as a unit. The only regret I have is we could never really have a reunion as a unit because people were coming and going at all times. I could say I maybe had four or five company commanders in nine months because it was replacements and of course people I worked with, they were there before me so they left ahead of me and we were always keeping track of our points at that time because in Korea you had to, if you were on a MLR, mainline of resistance, front line, which was the way war was fought back then for the most part. Uh, four points for being on the front line, three points for reserve, and then further reserve, two points. So if you can go to home at 36 points, you'd have to be nine months in a row front line. So, uh, but the, the risks were there too. But anyway, uh, that's the way it worked. So everybody kept track of their points. But there were occasions where there were people that had more than enough. I can remember one occasion where one fellow had 44 points and a representative from this country was there. And I couldn't tell you who that person was or where they were from. Was a, I think it was a woman representative. And he complained to her and she got him to go home. And he, would, he had more than done his. So they had the rule of 36 points in some areas. So everybody, when they heard about that, why everybody was. Check with the warrant officer. <laughs> it was interesting. Points and pay. Yeah, it was interesting. So it was. Uh, we were drafted, and uh, but you had to make up your mind. You were a part of that, and you were a team, and it, it got to be that way. It just you didn't think about it other than uh, someone would say he's an RA, meaning he joined regular army, and we were draftees, and of course. There's always a pecking order. If you're an RA and you were 17, there must be something wrong with you. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, but we had a lot of veteran military people, and uh, it's something I'll never forget. I mean, there was a lot of incidents and different things that went on in Korea. Uh, I don't know if I can remember all those, but there was well, quite a few. Yeah, we'll get to that. Were there were there officers that you served under, uh, and, and especially in your training, that maybe had uh, done service in, in World War II, had that kind of experience to yes. impart to you? Master sergeants, uh, you know, top sergeants, 
And I'm trying to think of officers. Well, we were proud to say, in, well, this was in Korea, though. We had Pat and Son as part of A Company. Well, I was in C Company. But uh, thinking back, you know, we, we did have uh, company commanders that served in the Second World War. Yes, I, as far as lesser lieutenants, I don't remember any, but I do remember company commanders that had served. And, and non-commissioned officers of master sergeant, pretty much, tell what, and they would tell us stories. And uh, met a lot of them on the way to Korea, met Second World War veterans, uh, very interesting people. Some were in 20, you know, they were all, they were in 20 years or more, so, uh, overseas. Uh, I remember that for two or three of them, they were going, they were about finished with their tour in Korea with points, and they were looking for their next place, and they were vying for Alaska, because Alaska was still a territory. So, well, Alaska's kind of expensive, but they would, they would, they wanted to go there. They didn't want to come back to the States and do garrison. They wanted to be out there. They were, you know, earning a living in the military, and uh, being overseas was a better deal for them. So, you met a variety of military people there. It's just, uh, I can't remember all the commanding officers I had. They're all good, I think, uh, generally, but uh, captains for the most part. I uh, met one colonel, I can't remember his name, but we were up in, up online in the bunkers and doing our job at that time. So. Well, let's backtrack a little bit and get you to Seattle. You took the train from Chicago to Seattle. Yes. How long were you in Seattle before you shipped out? Well, we were in Seattle, there again, uh, I think about a week. And uh, about a, well, we left on the 20, uh, I think we boarded the ship around the 23rd of December. Uh, I can remember that because I was born on the 22nd of December, and I could not legally buy a drink until I was 21. And uh, I was able to get one drink before I went overseas. <laughs> That's and, a memorable. Uh, they, had a, I, they, they had it. They, they really checked me out. They, none of these people would let me have one. So, but uh, that was one of the fun things besides. But uh, yeah, we. Uh, I'm trying to think. We spent maybe more than a week there. We were in a casual country. You know, you're in a casual company. It was Fort Lawton, and uh, those are uh, not the greatest place to be in a service. Casual company. Why is that? Because you're, it's a little loose, and there's uh, people going. You know, they're in, they're in transition to go someplace, and uh, there was a lot of hijinks, different thefts, different things. So it wasn't. Uh, and then the city itself, although Seattle was, was a, you know, 1953 or 52, December of 52. It was a different city than when I went back many, many years later. Uh, it was a place that you could still go to a dance hall and buy tickets for 10 cents a dance. That's one thing I remember about Seattle, other than the fact they wouldn't give me a drink. No. <laughs> I want to be a man. So. But anyway, uh, 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 then we left. Yeah. That was another momentous occasion when we left that day. People were very nice to us. They, every 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 troop got a package from the locals in Seattle, and uh, the package were, contained what? Uh, a variety of things, plus a book to read, and a number of little things in there. Cookies, Food items. Stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we each had our own little package, and it was kind of nice of them to do that. And they had the band and everything the day we left. We marched up to Pier 91. In Seattle, and uh, it was a great day like today. And they marched us, and next to us, to our left side, was this beautiful General Buckner. It was a beautiful ship, uh, painted blue. It was just a gorgeous ship. And we said, "Boy, we're going to go first class." And they said, <laughs> "Right turn." We marched. We got on this Marine Phoenix. Now, Marine Phoenix was made by the Kaiser Shipbuilding Company right near that area during the Second World War. Their goal was to build a ship a day, and they did. And it's a one-stack ship. It's 
So we left on the 24th of December, and uh, 18 days later we were in Japan. 18 days? 18 days, and, he, and we took the northern route. It was about 4,500 miles. But the second day was uh, seasick day, and there were about 3,000 of us on it. Yeah. Say 2,900 and plus were seasick. Were you among the? I was lucky. I didn't get seasick. I didn't have motion sickness. And you'd never been on a ship before? Not crossing an ocean no, or any other. No, no I wasn't. So uh, that was interesting. Uh, but that wasn't the best thing that could happen because since I wasn't sick, I had to go on KP and do other stuff that yeah. the other guys couldn't do. But uh, going over, that's an experience in itself. If you've never been on an ocean voyage or on a ship, that can you never know what the motion of a ship can take in the water. It's just any any which way and, and then some. Were you hitting any storms or was it just Oh yeah, the first day out we hit this two stacker and this one stack ship, I should say. One day we averaged two knots. Two. That's it. And they would rate it every day. We'd get a paper and said uh, the ship put out a one sheet paper and, and would keep us up to date. One day we have two knots. But uh, yeah, we went, we hit a storm the first time out. But there was, at that time, that troop ship went out on its own. There was no escort, mm -hmm. none, uh, none. We may, I can't remember if we see any ships going over. Yeah. We did see some other kinds of ships coming back. Yeah. But the uh, trip over was an experience. It was. Uh, uh, well, did they anticipate that there would be any enemy Hey, you know, we, we thought about that, but I think the, they weren't apparently not concerned about enemy navy uh, of, yeah. at all. It was never, never brought up. Uh, even when we got to Japan and then went to Korea, we went by ship around the south end of Korea to Incheon, yeah. and then we unloaded there. Yeah. Now, where did you let's uh, where did you land in Japan? Yokohama. That's an experience in itself. Every time a ship goes over there, uh, they have to repaint it. So we get up in the morning and here we hear this pink, 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 only it sounds like just a thousand hammers or whatever it is. So we got out and here's the Japanese labor uh, logistics taking care of that ship. And they were knocking all the paint off and it, it just woke up everybody, man. It was, it was interesting. It was a sunshine day. Everywhere you look, were uh, the mast everywhere. There were guys with hammers. They were, pre pre you know, paint the ship. And we got off with our duffel bag and took us to Camp Drake, uh -huh. which was the center for replacements coming and going. Yeah. I don't know about going, but I know that's where all the troops landed for the most part. And that's where the Army uh, had their base and then you were you were there for a while until they assigned you to a division in Korea yeah. and uh, that's an interesting piece right there Camp Drake because we would stand out at attention in the morning and we were standing over sewers and these sewers in Japan were full of human manure that's they used it for agriculture so that was uh, awakening, and uh, but was that, that intentional? No, I think that was just part of their sewer system. No, just, but I mean, was that intentional for you to be standing I that don't close know to that. the sewer? It, you, it just was part of the thing. You know, we never questioned it. Well, I, I remember we didn't like it that much. It wasn't that bad, but it was there. You know, it was it was noticeable. But e even then, when we went in Japan, they had taken us USO, and the Japanese people put on a show. A Western, like they were Americans, and it was, that was fun. Uh, from that country music, they had everything. And they really uh, went all out to uh, entertain us mm -hmm. while we were there. So there was a lot of pluses. The restaurants were great. Uh, it was, a, it was a, a, I liked Japan very much. How long? Uh, were you I wanted a, not long enough. I went there when we landed, and then later on I went for uh, what they called. Uh, rest and recuperation, it would send you there for a week. And it's just a lot to see there. But uh, 
I, I love the industry of the people, and the first thing that you there, they're moving. They're interested. They're, in the morning, the trains were small, and they pushed all these people on and get the kids all dressed up for school. Girls, I can see the girls in little navy blue navy uh, uniforms with the stripes in there, getting them on and getting them to school, and it was just a hubbub of busy people. Then we had a train trip on a miniature train, as we considered it, with miniature tracks for their country. They have an economy of land they have to make you. I don't know how, at that time there were about 90-some million people in uh, Japan. Now there's over 130. I don't know where they live. Uh, I'd have to go see because everything was terraced, the lands and the, uh, and the farmers. and quite a tight country. Uh, got to see honey dippers. Which are? Now, a honey dipper is it's a long uh, shaft with, uh, with a little uh, bucket at the end that he can tip. And that's how he fertilized with human manure. Mm. So that became a joke, a honey dipper. So that's what they call him for lack of a better name. I don't know what the Japanese call him. But uh, and then uh, also there's so many good things. Our mail caught up with us at that time. Yeah. Some of us had boxes of mail. You know, you think today emails and all this. Yeah. We had all physical mail. Were you were you writing very often back home? Did I write by? Yes. Yeah, I did. And uh, and your yeah. and your parents or your siblings? Who did you get mail from? Ah, I got from almost all of them. And then friends, others in the military themselves, in different areas, in this country, and, and in Korea. So we, yeah, we we. Uh, uh, you get any packages? Oh, packages from friends and family. Yes. What did they send you? Oh well, uh, a lot of good food, even uh, did it, did good it Italian, good Italian cold cuts. Ah, they didn't survive the, the mail. Pardon? It did survive in the Yes, mail? it did. It's surprising that people know how to package this stuff. Of course, we learned that in the Second World War. My mother did, and a lot of people did, because we were shipping to Europe, primarily to Europe and to different people, and we got to learn to wax up. They know how to preserve materials. So, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, we got, I got a lot, quite a few packages. I don't remember them all, but we did quite a few. Were you a popular guy when those uh, Italian cold cuts arrived? Yes, the uh, aroma would uh, catch everybody's eyes. Ear, nose, nose, <laughs> nose, catch everybody's nose. Anyway, yes, it was popular. When, when packages came, everybody was interested in what you got. So, yeah. same with mail. Yeah. Always felt, though, for those who didn't get anything, you know. Yeah. Or if you didn't. Now, literally, how long were you in Japan? You said not long enough, but how many days were you there? I, you know, I have to think back. It, uh, it could have been up to two weeks because, the reason I say that, we were destined for the 7th Infantry Division, and uh, for some reason they canceled it. In fact, when we left Seattle and they gave us some things to expect, uh, see, we went by ship, but there were some people that were flown over, but we were sent by ship. But they said you could be in Japan maybe 36 hours and you'll be in the front line in Korea. I mean, that could happen. But as it turned out, to a, we were supposed to go to the 7th Division, they canceled it, and then uh, how many days later they put us through the 40th, and then we boarded a ship and they took us to Korea, to Incheon. Incheon. We got off at that and we went to uh, Chinchon, was a replacement depot. How far was that from Incheon? Eh, that's center, center, center south of the 38th, of course, uh, uh, center by train. Korea. You went by train? You know, I, uh, I, I I believe so. I can't remember for sure. I probably don't remember how we, how we got off of Incheon at night. But anyway, I can't remember if we got on trucks. We may, we may have been on trucks. But anyway, we went to the replacement depot. And, uh, it was interesting there, too, because the warrant officer, was, if your turn came up, he said, what do you want to do? I'm serious. That's what he asked. What do you want to do? Really? Oh, what do you mean? He says, well, yeah, you, what would you like to do? And I think at that time you did have an opportunity, if you wanted to, uh, if you had a brother, I don't know if they allowed it then, but if you had a brother or a friend you wanted to be with that was already there, 
you might be able to request that, and they might transfer you to that. I didn't do that, but I could have. And then the other was you uh, had friends. Oh, did you? No, yeah, I had you know contemporaries that were there ahead of me. Yeah. Uh, but I had. Uh, I said, well, I'm, you know, I'm going to do what I was trained for, so I think I'll stay with the tank. So at that point, what was your actual occupation? What were you trained? You tanks. Were, you, you were tanks. Were you were you were an operator, a mechanic, or what? No, but it, in a crew, you learn all of it. From okay. driving to maintenance, in the tanks, preventive maintenance is first and foremost. The tank doesn't go anywhere unless it's taken care of. Like any good machine, you don't start it until you're sure it's going to go. So, we we would even have uh, maintenance stops in the tank. Tanks at that time, vibration, yeah. anything can come loose, and you don't want the track to come loose. So, 15. Yeah. The one size we dealt with was a 15 16 nut. Yeah. And we had a ratchet and a socket, and we got off, everybody got off and tightened everyone they could get at. So, And that could happen any time whenever the commander said, hey, maintenance, and yeah. prevent maintenance time. So, You were assigned to a specific tank? Yes. And was the tank already there, or did it come over with you? No, the tanks were already there. Okay. Were, so were you in. were inheriting tanks that had already been out. That's right. We were just replacement. We were replacements for people that already, you know, had handled them. So I don't know how long those tanks were there. If they were there from 19, the early part of the 50s when the war was first starting, strictly North Korea. Yeah. So you, so you arrived in Korea in January of 53? That's right. Okay. Uh, when you go through the casual companies, if I mulled that through my mind many times, from the basic training to the time I finally got into uh, a company where I could really serve, I was in transition. So by today's standards, I'd say that was a lot of wasted time in a sense. You know, we're not doing anything, we're just in transition, but that's the way it went. And they called it the pipeline, and maybe you could think of going through a pipeline slowly. But anyway, we were stationed uh, it was late January when I finally got to Charlie Company 140th Tank Battalion mm -hmm. and uh, stayed there until November, late November, late November or 60, of uh, 53. Now what was a typical day like? Well, obviously it would change as you went along, but when you were first there, when you first arrived, it was there a was there a typical day's routine, or did it change? You know, I, I don't remember a t particular, other than we lived in uh, uh, octagon-type tents at first, and uh, five of us in there. And you were, you guys were all in the same tank that's, crew? That's right. I mean, so there was that camaraderie of we're, right. we're in the tank together and we're also sleeping right. together. Right, yeah, yes. And, uh, I got to know everybody was welcome. It was, there wasn't any problem there meeting. Everybody was there for a reason. It was just getting to know everybody. Right. So You're you had never guy. met any of these guys before no, you arrived? No, I did go over with a few uh, men that went through basic with me and stayed with me the whole the whole time. Yeah, but they weren't in your, your particular They weren't in my group. tank, no. Yeah. No, they weren't. And it was all new people in my tank. Well, I think the captain put each one of us in a different tank, so break us in and uh, we stayed there for a while and then we, I think it was uh, our first mountain, we were in a blocking position, it was our first visit to the MLR, it was zero, it was winter. The famous Korean winter. We were, you know, uh, that's another comment, you know, they called it frozen chosen, uh, but the guys from Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New York, Minnesota, this was a piece of cake. But the guys from the south of California, this was frozen chosen. Yeah. Chosen is a Japanese name for Korea. Yeah. Chosen. Uh, but we call it frozen. You know, yeah. anyhow, yeah. we, uh, So were you well at the, were you well equipped in terms of uh, um, uniforms to wear in the cold? Yes, they had uh, they taken good care of us. Uh, the sleeping bags, fully zipped sleeping bags. So what do you mean by that? Well, apparently when they first went over, they had sleeping bags that only zipped halfway. And uh, many of them were caught in those bags by infiltrators. And, uh, <coughs> Excuse me. Sure. Did you know anybody who no. that happened to? No, that's 
scared the hell out of us. You heard the stories. And so we were grateful to have the new ones. And uh, not much different than in Iraq with the armor plate not sure. sufficient. Yeah. So when I heard about that, I thought about that. Yeah. Well laid plans and uh, all these engineers and all these people that build this stuff, yeah. manufacture it. I don't know how good it has to be yeah. necessary, but they learn. Yeah. Uh, what were the tanks doing then? Well, in that case, we were in a blocking position. We'd go up on a hill. Mm -hmm. They call them mostly hills, like Christmas Hill, Porkchop Hill. But some of them were pretty tall, and we were facing the MLR. And we could be in a blocking position for rock soldiers, which is Republic of Korea military in front of us or it could be any other group, because it was United Nations uh, troops that were in front of us. But for the most part, I think we were uh, associated with the uh, Republic, of, the Republic of Korea service and military. And in that, could, we were in a blocking position, whatever the blocking position meant, you know, we were just okay. young 21-year-olds, this is our job, this is what we do. Yeah. Uh, were you taking fire? No, we weren't taking fire at that time, but we were pulling guard. Uh, you had to do your two hours of guard. Well, there was a rule of how many hours you're supposed to guard, but there again, group dynamics. We said, it's so cold out there, to manage we're going to change every hour. So by morning, everybody didn't put, put more than one hour in that cold weather, even though you were well dressed yeah. with military uh, equipment and kept your feet warm as well as your body, so that, that, that was never a, a real problem. Yeah. But what you ate, you had to eat sea rations and no hot meal. No SOS. At that time. No, no, that was good, no SOS. But you met a lot of, uh, there again, you met a lot of people from all over, interesting backgrounds. Did, from, did you interact with the ROKs? Uh, in some respects, yes. and. Uh, uh, that's another uh, interesting thing. We, when we were up online uh, the first time, well, and, and even in that case, we were always in bunkers. Bunker built right on the side of the hill. And many of those bunkers were built by the Korean soldiers. And uh, they taught us how to get three men on a shovel. They would have one guy hold the shovel and push it in with his foot. And then they had comma wire at the neck, and the other two would pull it. So it kept was a unique way of keeping all their troops busy, but it's a because uh, they didn't have a shovel for each man. That's right. So they had three on a shovel, as many as three. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, they built the bunkers and uh, a lot of work, plus all the sandbags and all that. And we lived in those. Yeah. Uh, that was our home. And uh, uh, how did you the, eat them? The, the Koreans would come by, mm -hmm. and one day I remember the one sergeant came in with a mortar from the other side. I can still see that mortar. It was uh, robin egg blue, robin egg blue, with two yellow stripes around the middle of it, and fins on the back, and he's holding, he says, this is a dud. <laughs> but, but he would, we would talk to them. Now, he could speak, it was interesting, he was able to speak some English, so we met some very educated, well-educated, Korean soldiers, teachers, history teachers, uh, very interesting people. And uh, but then there were, you know, a lot of troops that didn't speak English. But well, we, we pressed elbows with them and uh, fed them. Uh, later on, one thing they did like, especially the younger ones, apparently didn't have much sugar in Korea. So if they could get sugar and put it in a glass of water. They thought they were. That was a treat. That was a treat. That was a treat. And uh, give them all the sugar. The only thing one time, it was, uh, the, the chefs made some turkeys. And they apparently put them out to cool off and they were going to cut them up. Yeah. Well, the next morning they went there. There wasn't a piece of meat on those turkeys. But the turkeys were there. <laughs> no meat on them. I don't know how they did that. but. <laughs> We have no idea who did it. <laughs> we so, was your impression of the uh, South Korean um, military pretty positive? Yeah, I, you know, I, I'll say this: when they 
their sergeants or their officers wouldn't get away with it in the American Army, but they were pretty they were pretty tough on their troops. They didn't hesitate. Phys physically. Physical contact, yes. Oh, yes, they, they, they were tougher. They had a different rule. Uh, they were a little rougher. I don't know how much training, if the Americans did any training for them, like you do today in the military where they take time to yeah. train. The Koreans had their own, South Koreans, uh, where their history of military, I don't know. Because that's such a rural part of Korea, it was South Korea, I thought, was more country, thatch, roofs, things like that. Today it's an yeah. industrial place, but yeah. back then I don't think it was. But. Now physically, where were you? You were near the 38th? We were right on the 38th. And th that was considered the line that that's would be That's the MLR, MLR, that's the, well, you know, that I, I may be inaccurate on that because as the, when the truce came, that was the line 38. So we were pretty much along that line area. I don't know if it was precisely on the 38th. All I can tell you was the MLR, main line of resistance. They were on that side and we're on this side. What was your sense of the ebb and flow at that, at that point of the war? I mean, did you, did you get a sense that there was a, an attempt to advance or you were defending or there was kind of a, a standoff? I'd say it was more like a standoff. There were occasions of, we had two battles that I was in, and uh, but nobody moved forward and nobody moved backward. Mm -hmm. But uh, there was a lot of fire. Yeah. A lot of fire. And this went on for how long? Until it ended. Until it ended. So, fact, you were, I, so you were basically doing the same thing right most through, days so, from the I time think, you arrived to the truce? Yes, I'd say, I, I forget when the truce was, sometime in July. July. Mm -hmm. Yeah, until it ended. And, uh, uh, and we were there a little while after that, but we moved from from uh, western Korea to, we wound up almost near the coast on the other eastern side. Oh, so you did move around well, the country? Well, you moved about every, it seemed like you moved every 30, 30 days. Oh, okay. Yeah, we, it wasn't a, a static situation. Uh -huh. We were moving. And when you moved, were you driving the tank? I didn't drive. I was... Well, I mean, when the, you, yes. you stayed in the tank in, in order yeah, we to took transport our, yourself. We took our equipment with us. Yeah. And the whole... So you were in the same tank the whole time you were in Korea? Well, I originally went on tank 76, and then I was on tank 77. There were some changes. Yeah. People changed, and I think I wound up on 77. Did the yeah. tanks have mechanical problems? because of the length of the war, the length of the, you know, the time they Well, you know, there was, there were some weaknesses on all that stuff. We, uh, uh, if you look at a tank gun, there's a bore evacuator. What is that? Well, the tanks we were on were a direct fire tank. What do you mean by that? Well, the way they are today, the gun shoots just like a rifle. Only it's a big round, like 90 millimeter. It's a pretty good sized round. We shoot it just like a rifle. And, uh, when that fires, there's gas that can come back into the tank. But there's a bore evacuator sitting outside. It looks like a stovepipe that's sitting on the on the gun. Yeah. And uh, if that's broke, you're going to get the gas in your tank cell, and uh, that can knock you out. Not kill you, but it can knock you out. Yeah. It's gas. It's pretty dangerous. So we had a complaint because they made them out of cast iron. It was very fragile. If a mortar round came in, it was you know, just a mortar shell, which is supposed to be breaking up, could penetrate that and and shut down our gun. Yeah. That's our defense. Yeah. So we we manually took that off and replaced it. So we called on them. They'd sent us a new bar evacuator. But if we pulled up the line and got hit again, that, we knew that that could happen again. So you want to keep your you want your tank to move and you want it to be able to fire. So, Did you get hit very often? Well, if we if we went out on a shooting mission, now we didn't travel, we went to our slot and fired on the MLR, the other side. We'd pull back and we could wait and we could almost be sure within 15 minutes or so incoming rounds would come. They would let us have it back. Yeah. That's when you had to be in your bunker. Hopefully, in the, in so there. you evacuated the tank and let you just put pulled the tank back in there and yes and uh, 
you got to be careful because every time you expend it around, you have brass yeah. sitting outside. You have to, you can't leave that brass out there. So, so why? Well, no, actually, you, you could put. That's a mistake. When you when it, the round goes off, the brass comes back into the okay. into your uh, cupola, and you have to do something with it. So some of them were throwing it off, but the smart ones were putting it right back into the slot where they took one out. Uh -huh. So a tank has a, a, a ammo bay, and each round fits in it, just like eggs would fit in a hole, and a round would fit in there. So uh -huh. you could put that. That was a smart move, because then once you got done firing, you could just get out of the tank and get in your bunk. You didn't have to go clean up brass. Because yeah. if any time you were outside, you were exposed, and you didn't know when those rounds might come in. Yeah. So uh, we were fortunate uh, to do it right. And, uh, Did you ever see the enemy? Never saw any. Never saw. We, we had evidence they were there because if we hit somebody and it was snow, you could see where the they dug it out again with you know binoculars. Yeah. We could see where they. Yeah. We knew they were there. But you did. Did you have any sense of the success of your your firing on the enemy? Did you get? Did anybody ever report to you? Oh, that was a good. You hit. Yeah, I got. You a, took out a. I got a corporal rating for it. No. Just they just asked me, you know, on a combo, combo wire radio. It's not as sophisticated as today. Sometimes the radios didn't work as well as they should. Yeah. But he told me what to do, and I did it. And uh, but that's the only reason I. I knew how to handle that particular uh, gun. Yeah. Each one had its own peculiarities, and you had to learn how to zero in on the target they asked you to do. Yeah. And I uh, was lucky that day. So, so were you operating? Were you operating the gun every day, or was it a rotating kind of thing? No, no, I was the gunner. You were the gunner. I was the gunner. I was going to be the loader, but the guy that was going to be the gunner didn't want to be the gunner, so. Would you like to be the guy? It's okay. So yeah. did you you switched with him, or did he go to another tank? No, no, he he stayed as the loader. He, he stayed was, as the loader. He didn't want to shoot a gun. So. Oh. Did he ever say why? No, he never did. But I still know his name, Jim Merritt. He, lived in, uh, yeah. he did live in uh, Jacksonville, Florida. Yeah. Would love to see him again. He was a good guy. Yeah. And he was he was a black man. He was a wonderful individual. Yeah. But we got along fine. Now you talk about life in the bunker. Was uh, how was that heated, especially in the winter? It must have been. Well, I, I'm trying to remember. I know that they would bring us up one hot meal a day in this one situation where we were firing. We were in a combat deal. They would bring us up one meal a day, and of course that's humorous in itself because it usually was the same thing: sweet potatoes, peas, and ham. Now, you've got to understand, a military dietitians in Washington recommends that for keeping us alive. So we had that, plus sea rations. And uh, of course, we went through the sea rations. Our favorite was uh, wieners and beans and uh, uh, spaghetti and meatballs. If we could get that search for, if we got the sea rations with anything else, and it wasn't too good. But we got chocolate. But I think we did have a, a little Bunsen burner of some kind, of, uh -huh. so we could heat. And we did make breakfast. We, they brought us, when they bring us the hot meals, they would also give us yeah. eggs and bacon. We used the bacon and fat. So yeah. we lived in that little thing, and it was tight. There was five of us in there, yeah. and bunk up and down. And, uh, and did you have before a, we went a up stove, there, or how did you heat the place? I'm just saying we had a little, oh no, just, we had no heating. No I heating? I don't remember any heat in it. Oh, so you just we, had to we, curl up in the sleeping we bag. We were dressed warm every day and we had our sleeping bags and somebody on guard. We yeah. all had to take turns guarding. How about hygiene? Did you guys ever get to take showers? Well, they would take us down maybe once a month so we could shower and stuff yeah. like that. Other than that, it was GI, use your helmet and got water and clean yourself, shave yourself. Every day you had to do that. Yeah. You had to be still had to stay in shape. So, yeah. and you kept your place clean. I remember the colonel coming up, and uh, someone came up to me and said, "Didn't you see the sock on the floor?" Someone left us, but the place was clean. We kept it clean, yeah. and that was very important that we did. Yeah. But they let us go down. We knew we were going up there. We had one cot that we would load with PX merchandise, food, candy bar, you name it, and everybody pitched in. And 
fill that up. You know? So we were up there at least a month, month. I can't drink. that particular situation I remember the most. It was uh, very active and uh, very good. Did you get any breaks? You mentioned R and R before. Well, R and R, you had to be there. I forgot how many months before they would consider it. And then if your turn came up, they would send you something like four or five months before you could go. So it was summertime when I went. You uh, went before the truce or after? You know, I, I don't remember. No, I think, uh, I think it was before the truce. Uh -huh. I'm not sure of that, though. I can't you say Went that. to Japan? Japan. That's where they sent everybody. Did you go back to Yokohama? No, we went to, you had choices if they were available, Osaka, Kokura. I went to Kokura. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't go to Osaka. I, I only regret that I didn't go to I don't know if I could go to Nagasaki or see the atomic thing, mm. but here, there for for fun and relaxation, yeah. and uh, take good care of us. We had all the restaurants were. It wasn't a Class A restaurant. They advised us not to go in. Yeah. The service was excellent. We washed our hands. It was it was really unique because we'd walk in and have one young lady come up and wash her hands, yeah. and then they would take her. Did you sample local cuisine? Did you, you know, I don't Japanese? recall doing that. I think most of us ate steak. You know, when they saw something, they thought, oh, man. And yeah. the restaurants were keyed in on they it. They were geared for that. that. The Japanese were very, you know, at that moment, were very into supporting us in that war, in the Korean War. Uh -huh. So even the hotels uh, catered to us big time. Uh, I. Uh, the hotel I stayed at, got to know the people there. And, uh, one thing we were in, we had script. You know, we didn't have any American money. We're not allowed any American money. Yeah. We had script. Yeah. So one day the one day the uh, uh, owner of the hotel came up to me and gave me American cash. Mm -hmm. Now he could have taken that to the black market, and Chinese would give him. Lot of yen for the, He gave them to me. He says, I'm giving you these. I want you to take them. If you would take them to the where you can exchange these, uh, I'm not supposed to have these. So he gave them to me. I felt honored that he did that. I felt good about him doing yeah. that. Yeah. But there were some good uh, cultural things. The shower, they had their way of doing it. They had the shower, and then they had the deep tub, uh -huh. hot. You get in that after you wash yourself. That's uh -huh. to suit you. So, I love Japan for their comfort. Yeah. You walked into their homes, shoes off, walk on a soft, warm floor. Uh -huh. uh, they knew how to heat their places, all sliding doors. I thought they do everything for comfort. And I was yeah. very uh, odd with that. That was kind of neat. Was it tough to go back? Pardon? Was it tough to go back to Korea after that? Well, you know, I had to go back. Yeah, we'd like to stay longer, sure. Yeah. But, uh, we're grateful for that week. So, yeah. Yeah. so as the as the truce approached, you must have been getting some idea that the war was winding down. Were, well, you, were you getting some kind of scuttlebutt? I think I think uh, Stalin died at that time. I think he didn't he die in in fifty three. Yeah. yeah, he died in March or somewhere. Yeah. Of course, we cheered that, and uh, we knew that there was a lot of things at Palm and John and all Palm and. Yeah. Uh, but, and then there were late hits on different places to, uh, they wanted, the North Koreans wanted certain positions before they made a truce. So there were some casualties right at the end that were yeah. harder than some of the battles before. So yeah. there was a battle of positions and uh, whether we were going to stand up to that or let them have it. And I think they thought, we were so ready to, for peace that we'd let them have it, and we didn't. As far as I know, we didn't. I guess the famous one is Porkchop Hill. Yeah. I think they have a documentary on that where yeah. we're not going to back up, we're going to go up and yeah. we're not going to give it up. So it was a struggle right at the end until they finally agreed. And it's still a truce, yeah. as my daughter reminded me. Yeah. It's still a truce. Did you, um, did you know anybody personally who was, who was killed or injured over there? Uh, Marines, a uh, couple in my company, a lot of them wounded, but uh, uh, 
not a whole lot of them. So. All right, we're going to pause here so we can change the tape and then we'll continue in just a second. Thanks. Thanks.